Okay, so first of all, I want to thank our friends of Ali who help make these kinds of programs possible. Um, our program wouldn't be possible without the wonderful support of our friends of Ali. So I wanna send out our deepest thank you for that. Um, and I wanna welcome everybody today to the um, Ali Brownberg lunch presentation. During the meeting, we ask that you please mute yourselves um, unless you have a question. And as far as questions, um, we ask that you put them in the chat or um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask them. If you put them in the chat, I will find a good breaking point and um, go ahead and ask those questions for you. Um, and also we may have time at the end for a Q&A. Um, so our brown brags, um, it's gonna begin yeah, shortly, but I did wanna- Alex, something's not working with your screen. Oh, this is probably it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so I do wanna remind um, everyone here that our spring session is underway. We have a lot of courses. And so um, in terms of deadline, we ask that you register no later than three days before the class start date. Um, and registration forms are accepted until 4 p.m. when our office closes. Um, we can usually accommodate people if they end up, let's say you, you didn't see the class before and it's tomorrow. We do try to accommodate people like that. So don't hesitate to sign up if that happens, but we do try to three days um, to help things get processed. So during the meeting, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand using the Zoom or your actual hand, and we'll try our best to get your questions answered. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see kind of how the icons look where you can raise your hand. It's under reactions, and then you'll just click raise your hand. Um, this is exciting. We just got this news yesterday, or the day before. Wait, yesterday was Sunday, so maybe Friday. So the open, um, the open house is today for the library. Um, it's from 3 to 5 p.m. And all the members are actually now, um, all the members and community members are actually now allowed to go into the library. So if you've been wanting to go in, now is the perfect opportunity. And like I said, today is the open house from 3 to 5. Um, when you do come in, you will, will be asked um, for a student ID card or some kind of identification. So just be prepared for that. But it's exciting, it's open finally after almost two years. Um, I do wanna remind um, people, if you're not an OLLI member or you're thinking about being an OLLI member or um, you are an OLLI member and you wanna take advantage of the OLLI scholarships, um, these are actually made possible by the Friends of OLLI and they help students take um, two classes per term under a scholarship. So um, email us if you have any questions about this or email us if you would like a form. You can also find the form online. Um, this is another exciting news. So Tracy Barnes Priestley, she is, um, she's an instructor for Ollie and she also hosts the Let's Connect on Friday, but she does a lot of other things. And so the second season of What's on Your Bucket List is coming out and Tracy has asked um, us to kind of see, offer this to our OLLI members, um, which if you have something on your bucket list or you have something you've always wanted to do, um, I highly, highly encourage you to sign up. This show um, picks a few participants and they actually just cross something off of their bucket list. And the only requirement is that you have to be at least 60 years old. Um, I'm a little bit jealous because I wanted to sign up and do something on my bucket list. Um, but you guys all have the opportunity to do it. The application is going to be on www.keep forward slash org forward slash bucket. And I can also put the link in the chat later on, but I think this is so exciting and cool. Um, there is going to be COVID protocols in place, so there's, we don't have to worry too much about that, but this is a very exciting opportunity. Um, so before we get started, I do want to acknowledge the land that we're on. Um, it is ancestrally belongs to the Weop people, which includes the Weop tribe, the Bear River Rancheria, and the Blue Lake Rancheria. Um, the Weop people continue to remain in relationship with the area. 
and they're deeply connected through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. And they are important parts of the history, but also um, they're important parts of like the living history and creating and taking care of the land today. And lastly, I wanna thank all our Ali volunteers. Um, you guys are very special and help out a lot with programming. So we appreciate you and thank you. I think we're, I'm gonna hand it off to Jane and she can introduce our speaker for today. Hi there, everybody. Welcome and thank you for coming in on this absolutely wonderful sunny day. <laughs> it's probably the warmest day of the week, but we're happy to have you here and delighted to bring you Reese Hughes, who is an author and trail guide. He's authored a local trail guide called Hiking Humboldt 101 Short Day Hikes, Urban and Road Walks. He and his wife, uh, Amy Uyiwiki moved to the North Coast 34 years ago and fell in love with Humboldt County's wonderful blend of rugged coastline, redwood forests, oak woodlands, wild rivers, and beautiful mountains. He commented, perhaps it takes a flatlander from Kansas to appreciate such a rich landscape. He worked in students affairs at HSU for nearly 25 years and Amy and he have raised two loving daughters. He currently coordinates the local trail stewards group that helps maintain local trails, participates in Equity Arcata pursuing his current concern for students suffering housing insecurity and is a major Ollie contributor. We thank you. He's an advocate for the Humboldt Bay Trail and he's been coordinating the trail students for more than a decade and Many, many people now come out and help maintain these trails voluntarily, which is fabulous. So Reese, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ollie. Um, I'm going to share my screen. That's really the essence of what I'm going to talk about today. Well, it is a spectacular day. And if, if I can work it, I'll talk fast and we'll be out of here in time to enjoy one of these walks that I'm talking about. So, um, but I don't want you to hesitate to ask questions, ideally using the chat feature, but uh, we can try to, to incorporate them as we go. Um, and next time, I really am hoping that we'll be meeting in person, personally. Um, just a small correction to Jane's introduction. Now, as of March 1st, uh, Amy and I have lived here 36 years. So the number keeps, keeps growing a bit. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about accessible trails in Humboldt County. Um, it's sort of a review, uh, but I, I have some things I'll admit as we go uh, to some of my limitations. This is a photo of Joy Harden, who uh, along with Jim are watching today. Uh, and I wanna give the credit for this photo to Jim Alperdink, but this is the Bay Trail North um, early on in its creation and a wonderful place to sort of appreciate and use uh, a motorized wheelchair is in Joy's case, a scooter. All right, I'm gonna clean up my screen a little bit here. So my plan. Well, the first thing I wanna do is to talk a little bit about the types of accessible trails in Humboldt County. And then I'm gonna go over a review of from north to south in the county of the accessible trails with a brief description and my own comments on them. And I'd encourage you to take notes. This will be recorded, but uh, it's always easier if you take notes um, and don't hesitate to ask questions. At the end, I'm gonna talk about just a couple of other small resources, not the least of which is a, a movement towards beach uh, wheelchairs, beach specific wheelchairs. I'm gonna do my own land acknowledgement. I think in part, not because uh, Ollie's is inadequate, but 
because I'm sort of learning my way through this. And as I have been to all parts of this county, I really have recognized more than ever that we are in a place that has been handed off and with un, uh, unceded territory, handed off and treated with such respect that I thank the original caretakers of this land and commit to, to being their, their commitment and continuing that commitment to being a steward of our shared home. And one of the ways that I want to try to honor this history is by using more and more indigenous place names. Um, I'm going to start very modestly. Um, these are the six that I really am going to do my best to incorporate into the talk today. I'm sure I'll make mistakes, but uh, I guess I'm trying to learn my way. And I think it's important that we all make an effort to do so. And understand that when we talk about Humboldt Bay, it is, it is pronounced or called Wiki or Wiggy. Um, one of the challenges with using English script for native expressions and, and uh, phonics is that they don't translate necessarily that well. And so that's why sometimes you'll see it as Wiggy and sometimes as Wiki because both have sort of similar sounds. Um, I found very useful, you'll see a, a link at the bottom of this, uh, this slide um, to a, a short video that we ought have on their website um, that really is uh, an excellent, excellent primer to beginning to appreciate the pronunciation of some of these key place names. Badawat and sometimes Potawat is Mad River. Hikshari is Elk River. Weot is Eel River. Tutalwat, Indian Island. And then the Yurok name for Patrick's Point is Sume. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I want to acknowledge also from the very beginning that I have other limitations as well. One is that I'm able-bodied able and that really limits my ability to really know and understand the, the challenges of, of a trail. Uh, another thing I really want to indicate is that as soon as I talk about a particular trail or series of trails, it's out of date. Things change all the time. Maintenance gets postponed, a tree falls down, there's a slide. Other something or other that, that changes sign, signs, maintenance comes and goes. So the more that you will be traveling to do a particular walk or have a particular experience, I really encourage you to make sure that the trail is in good condition. It may involve a phone call or somehow checking on a website to make sure that the trails are open. And always, always use your, your best judgment. Um, if it, if something seems unsafe, then don't, don't do it. Um, one of my own references, obviously, is the book Hiking Humboldt Volume 2, which is the one that I, I put together. Um, in it, we have, I tried to indicate with a little symbol, um, hikes that had accessible components. Um, it, too, is out of date. Some of the things I'll be talking about today are not included in Hiking Humboldt, and certainly not with the level of, of explanation or nuance that, that I'll talk about today. So there are several types of trails that are classified as accessible. The first are considered called class one multi-use trails. And in California, these are paved, right-of-way, uh, exclusive, for cyclists, pedestrians, and non-motorized vehicles with motorized wheelchairs being an exception. They typically are 10 feet in width. And a good example would be the Bay Trail, most of the waterfront trail, uh, the new trail, the Annie and Mary Trail segment that's been done in Blue Lake are all good examples of class one multi-use trails. And when the remaining four miles of the Bay Trail are complete, that too will be a class one multi-use trail. The uh, plans for the extension of 
Danny Mare Trail from Larson Park in Arcata out to Pump Station One is planned to be a class one multi-use trail. So they're exciting things that have been done, but there are even more exciting options ahead. Then the state park has created uh, its own standard for ADA trails. And I, I really wanna take a moment just to commend the state park system because they have made a, a concerted effort over the last 25 years since, uh, since the ADA was put into place in 1990. They've made a concerted effort to uh, retrofit existing trails, to build new trails that meet these standards. And as a result, a lot of what I'll be talking about uh, are credited to the state parks and their efforts. There are, it's important to understand though what a state park standard means. It does not mean that they're paved. It, it usually means that they have a very uh, hard compacted surface, which is important. They work to be no less than 36, three feet wide, 36 inches minimum width. And then they have certain conditions. If, if they are uh, less than five feet wide, uh, in terms of responding to that. They try to make sure there are no obstacles along the route. Um, the grade is a, guaranteed to be a minimum of 5% with some possibilities for shorter segments that are uh, greater uh, grade levels. So it could have grades that are up to um, say between five and 8.33%, uh, but those sections of trail can only be 200 feet long. If they're more than 8.33% grade, then they can only be a maximum of 30 feet long. So it's really important to understand when you see an, a state park ADA trail that it does not mean that it's paved, uh, it means it's hard packed, doesn't mean that it's totally flat always, um, but it meets these criteria. So um, another, and my final disclaimer is that I focused on physical and mobility issues, not on hearing and low vision limitations. One of the nice things about the state park trails is that at the entrance to any trail, they have put up signs like this one that uh, show the length and some of the conditions of that particular trail. So it's a good way to sort of understand what the, what you would encounter. One of the things about state park trails that I will complain about is that um, I think it's, it's to some extent a, a factor of restricted maintenance money. They do a great job of building the trails, but they're not always great about the maintenance of those trails at this ADA standard. So uh, again, a, a reason to, um, double check sometimes before you make a, a great effort to go do one of these particular trails. I think I've done every one of the ones that I'm going to talk about today in the last six months, uh, but it's uh, been winter time and uh, it could change. Um, sometimes they also don't get to the maintenance of those until they have summer crews and seasonal crews available. All right. I'm going to start from north to south and talk about a series of uh, probably some 35 trails or so that we'd like to highlight. I'm going to start with the Prairie Creek and the, the Big Loop Trail and sort of the combined Prairie Creek and Redwood State Park. But then I'm going to talk about their Elk Prairie Loop, Davidson Trail, Lady Bird Johnson Grove, and then the Redwood Creek Trail. But I also want to mention that on the first Saturday, of every month that Newton B. Drury Parkway, which is the old 101 that goes through the, through the park is closed to motorized vehicles and open to pedestrian cyclists and, and wheelchairs. So it's a great chance to sort of uh, have a different kind of experience um, in, in, the, in the park. Okay, uh, um, Apologize for my trigger finger. It seems to send these slides forward. There are, I'm gonna to go to the map here. And if you can follow my cursor, basically this area is where the visitor center is in Prairie Creek Redwoods. Here's Newton B. Drury Parkway coming off of 101. 
there are there's as much as six mile loop that's accessible uh, here, but it can be broken into a variety of shorter options. My personal favorite, and I think the best of the lot, is the 1.1 mile length along Prairie Creek Trail. It's the Prairie Creek Trail here. It's, it's 1.2 miles long. It goes along, it, it's quite flat. Um, it would be an out and back unless you do the uh, parallel trail on the east side of Newton B. Drury Parkway that goes past Big Tree and down the Foothill Trail. And uh, it's about equal length to the Prairie Creek Trail and then with the short uh, connector over back to do make it a full loop. So the full loop is about a three mile uh, round trip and uh, it's hard packed surface. And I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute, but I wanna uh, come back to this particular component, which is the Southern Loop. This stretch here, the Elk Prairie Trail on the east side of Newton B. Drury Parkway is an example of a trail that has been relatively recently retrofitted to be State Park ADA standards. Um, it, it has some little steeper sections on here, but it's uh, it sort of makes for a, a wonderful loop. Um, this stretch goes through the campground and can be a little confusing. Uh, so I often would suggest just using the campground road to get back. But um, either way, you, they're, they're wonderful options. And all of this can be done as out and back options as well, or some sort of pick and choose combination. Um, here's an example of the sign again, prior to the beginning of the Prairie Creek Trail itself. Um, all right, and, and the Prairie Creek Trail includes a number of bridges because it crosses Prairie Creek a number of times. and um, gives you a sense of what a ADA accessible trail looks like in the park. Um, it has uh, plenty of width to be able to make these sharp corners um, and it's relatively flat and uh, it's, it's beautiful. There are other things that you will see along the way. I love the big leaf maple, uh, especially in the fall when they start to turn their amazing yellow colors. All right, I better keep moving here. Lady Bird Johnson Grove. Lady Bird Johnson Grove is uh, up Bald Hills Road. Um, sometimes it's not included in the state park outline of accessible trails because of the very steep section from the parking lot. It's very short, it's, it, but it's very steep to get on the bridge up and over Bald Hills Road. But once you've made that climb and are up and over, um, it, is, it is a wonderfully flat one and a half mile long, partially loop trail. Uh, it can also be an out and back. Sometimes this stretch right here, I think can be a little bit narrow and a little bit under maintained, but it's a, it's a beautiful stretch. It looks a lot like this is the trail here. Again, a hard pack surface. Um, it could be a little bit crowded in peak visitor times because it's one of the go-to places from tourists, but it's good any time of the year. I also wanted to talk for a moment, just to take a little break here and talk about service animals. Service animals are allowed on all trails in the national and state parks, but they're very specifically defined as a, a, a trained dog, uh, or really as a dog um, trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of the individual with a, with a disability. They are not to be confused with therapy or emotional support animals, and those the park uh, considers pets, and they are not allowed on any state park trails, leashed or unleashed, uh, any national park trails. Um, they are allowed in some of the campgrounds and a few other places, but not on any of the trails. And it's important to understand that uh, because that's throughout the state park system in Humboldt County. Okay, the Davison Trail. This is an old haul road, and you can see a typical example of the surface 
here it stretches. I'm going to go to the next slide and I'll come back. I don't have perfect maps in all of these cases. I, I have adapted maps I've used for other purposes, so I apologize for that. But the, the old Hall Road extends from the Prairie Creek Visitor Center for six miles, basically, along Prairie Creek again, all the way south to this area, which is Elk Meadows Day Use Area, and a place you're much more likely to see elk than uh, near Prairie Creek Visitor Center itself. And it extends around to a crossing of 101 that must be done carefully, and then a paved stretch of Davidson Trail as it goes to Lost Man Creek Road. So this whole stretch is about six miles long, and it's either paved or um, hard packed uh, surface. Most of it ad adheres to the um, uh, uh, gradient restrictions, but uh, not all of it. My own personal recommendation is there are a number of en entry and access points. Uh, my own personal recommendation is that uh, you go to the middle here. It's a, it's a nice stretch with, with toilets and uh, picnic areas and a spacious parking lot and allows you to go either direction if you want to, either this way along Davidson Trail, it's an old hall road, as I mentioned, or along the, this part that goes around the Elk Prairie area where your Elk Meadows, I should say, where you're likely to, to see elk. Um, Another interesting thing that is worth noting is that there's another new trail that the state or the Redwood National Park is in the process of, of doing that will go from this side right over here to the proposed new visitor center, which will be located at the side of the old Arcata Redwoods mill uh, off of Bald Hills Road. Uh, it's about a 1.1 mile long that will connect the new proposed visitor center with, with the uh, um, uh, Davidson Trail. And that's supposedly will be done in 2022. Okay, Redwood Creek Trail this is another one that's not always listed as an ADA accessible trail, but uh, the first mile, much of that trail is not accessible. Once they put the summer bridges in uh, and you're tempted to go farther than that you'll see a lot of people that are going to go the six or seven mile length of that. But uh, the first mile uh, is, this is a, a photo of the first mile and it is a very flat, uh, again, hard packed surface with, uh, with bridging over the water courses um, for about the first mile. All right, let's move south to Trinidad and McKinleyville. Um, I'm not going to talk about a couple of the trails I've listed here, partially because I have some reservations about them. The Mid-City Trail is a half-mile trail in, in McKinleyville that goes from the south side of Widow White Creek, just south of the high school, and it goes through a narrow uh, pathway with high fences on both sides. It's a, it's a housing development area. I find that it really doesn't go anywhere of note. So while accessible, uh, I'm not sure it's totally worthy. Uh, another area that I think is, comes with an asterisk is the Mad River Bluffs area. Um, the McKinleyville Land Trust has aspirations to really make it more of an of a accessible trail system. But right now, it only goes out to a, a, a little overlook. Uh, it's quite short. And uh, I, I'm not sure that it were, warrants a special consideration, but, oh, and I, I should mention number six here, which is a, a new trail that's scheduled to be done later in 2022, which is a Mad River, I mean, sorry, the McKinleyville Community Services District is partnering with Cal Trout to create a, a half mile ADA accessible trail to a series of old oxidation ponds that are being connected with um, Badawat or Mad River to um, as a, a place where young, uh, young salmon can sort of find refuge before they go out into the Mad River and seek their way past the gauntlet of seals and, and everything else um, 
out to the ocean. So that's that's sort of an exciting new possibility that's that's coming. Okay. So Sume, I, I need to say that um, I, I've watched a couple of videos that Skip Lowry, who is a ranger with Sume State Park, about the pronunciation of that. And he says that there is no hard G sound in Yurok. Uh, the last EG basically means habitually, and it was habitually used as a fishing camp by a couple of, of uh, Yurok villages in that area. So apparently Sume is more the cor correct pronunciation. There are a number of trails in Sume State Park, but uh, unfortunately due to some, uh, I think, structural problems with the geology of that particular park, some of the trails have been hard to maintain as ADA accessible. So there are only two that I'm going to highlight. Um, and one is the ceremonial rock to uh, basically, I think I'm going to move to the next. Again, this is an uh, adapted map, so I apologize for that. So let me talk about them and follow my cursor. This is the visitor center, the small visitor center at the entrance to the, to the park. Um, and if you follow the, the ADA accessible trail from the visitor center, around Ceremonial Rock and it ends functionally at the park road here. And it's about 7.5 tenths of a mile long. So 0.75 miles long. Um, it is not totally accessible to get to Sume Village itself, unfortunately. And I'm hoping that will be one of the changes that happen going forward. But uh, it's, it's a delightful trail. The second one, is a section of the rim trail that goes from the Wedding Rock parking lot here to the, um, in the campground area, there's a fireplace area. And it's about nine tenths of a mile long. And it includes a wonderful uh, sort of spur that goes out to Patrick's Point with great views out over the ocean. So it's only nine tenths one way, but it's really quite a delightful uh, accessible walk. So. Out of all of these various walks in the park, those really are, um, are the only ones at this point that I consider to be accessible. The others have, uh, through a variety of challenges, are really not functionally accessible. The Hammond Trail. Most of you are familiar with this. Again, it's, it's an area, a, a, a long six point two mile trail that has a variety of accessible stretches. The whole thing is not accessible, but there are some lengthy stretches that are with many access points, which is really a, a wonderful part of that. Let's see, the uh, Hammond, uh, the stretches that I think are, are some of the most satisfying and ac accessible are from Hiller Park. Uh, Hiller Park going south to School Road, Hiller Park going north to Murray Road are both paved and, and accessible. Um, there's a little stretch as you cross, um, uh, let's see, the, the road into the castles and the gated community here that's a little steep for just a short period of time, and then a little steep coming out of the trail up here to the Murray Road parking area. Then there's a stretch going north and it's, it's pictured here, the lower left-hand side going north that's unpaved and it is accessible going along uh, Badawat itself um, with some nice viewpoints, but then it's a one way out and back of hard pack trail because then it's too steep after that. So the main accessible paved trail goes on west all the way to Let's Road uh, with the steep stretch that in my eyes makes it a little less um, ADA friendly. Um, and then of course the stretch uh, from the parking lot at Clam Beach County Park all the way to the base of the uh, elevated uh, stretch that goes up to the Vista Point. That's paved and, and accessible and about 1.2 miles long one way. And uh, so the, the Hammond Trail has a number of 
of areas that um, are paved and accessible and, and some stretches that are not. My own recommendations again are to start at, at Hiller Park or start at the Clam Beach County Park and going forward. You can stop at the end of Airport Road there, but it's sort of short unless you're uh, prepared to use Let's Road as a more lengthy uh, access point. Um, sort of went through all this information. This is an example of what the paved area looks like. Most people in Humboldt County that have been here for any length of time, unless you're from South County, really know and appreciate the Hammond Trail and, and its access. And I also have to stick in a picture of trail stewards uh, who uh, on the first Saturday of every month, which was this last Saturday, uh, they do a lot of maintenance uh, on, on this trail. And we have volunteers that do that on a number of the trail sections that, that I highlight today. Here's an exciting development. It's not long, but it just recently was completed by the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust. And that is a, a short paved path at Huda Point. And while uh, it's not long in length, it sure packs in a, a wonderful view access. And with plans to, to add two picnic tables and three benches, and some informational signage and eventually a secure portable restroom. But um, this is a very exciting development, a place to come and, and have access to something that you wouldn't have had access in, in a wheelchair for, for a long, long time, if ever. Another one that I think is sort of special and underappreciated uh, my wife and I come here periodically for uh, on a nice evening to appreciate the sunset and the view out over the Mad River Bottoms. Um, there are at the, the trailhead access is at the south end of Mill Creek Cinemas Access Road. Um, there's a parking area there and two four tenths of a mile long loops. They're short. I personally would only really recommend the westernmost loop. Um, there are benches available, benches like where you can get views like this one. It's a hard packed surface um, and, um, and it's flat. So it's, it has all those virtues and, and well worth uh, considering. Here's another picture of the, of the trail itself. Okay, I'm gonna take a drink. Hey Reese, this mm -hmm. is Kim. There are a couple of questions in the chat since you're taking a drink and maybe sure. it should be a good time to, to um, circle back to a few of them. The first question that I see is, um, are these photos available in your book or elsewhere? The, the photos? Uh -huh. uh, some of them are. Okay. Uh, I think all the maps that I've shown except for the Hammond Trail map are in the book um, and then it's worth noting that this will be recorded and available if you want to uh, uh, fast forward through sections to uh, appreciate the photos. So right, right. And then um, uh, there's a comment that the Perry Creek Trail is now called the Carl Knapp Memorial Trail. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. I did make a note of that, and uh, thank you yeah. for pointing then, that out. Scrolling down, there's a. Um, can any of these trails be accessed from public transit? Well, not easily. Uh, you know, even we're getting to a series of trails that can be, uh, but the, the closest, uh, yeah, e you know, even the Hammond Trail, um, there, I'm trying to think if there, no, it's pretty difficult. So, so pay attention to those <laughs> of you that are dependent on public transit to, uh, and we'll start with uh, the Pot Potawat village um, as one that is accessible. The Bay Trail North, the Arcata City Trail are all accessible by public transit, the Arcata Marsh. The Annie and Mary Trail in Blue Lake is. Uh, the Blue Lake Levee, not so much. But um, 
And then going forward, a number of the trails on the Eureka segment are accessible as well by public transit. Um, and to some degree in Fortuna as well. And there's one in Rio Dell that would be. All right, I'm gonna talk about the Arcata segment. Those are good questions though. This is another one of the, I think, hidden gems. Um, the Potawat Health Village in the north part of Arcata is built on a 40 acre site, half of which very intentionally done uh, restoration of wetlands and some wonderful efforts to sort of uh, build in some orchards and a productive fruit and vegetable garden. It has two, about two miles worth of trails, not all of which are accessible. And it has a, a, a half mile paved loop here, a concrete paved loop that goes around the center part of the grounds past the wetlands. Um, here, I have a map that could be a little bit confusing. And this also sh shows one of the, the paved trails. This is the paved loop option in the middle. Um, using my cursor to go around that in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the complex. Um, these, this trail here is paved. This trail is paved to the parking lot. So those are the ones that are, are paved and would be accessible for wheelchairs. This, this, is, this one is paved. Then actually some of the farther out are not paved and would not be very accessible. They tend to be grassy and at times get overgrown, but the others are, are excellent. And it's a nice place to go on a, a warm evening for a little uh, movement around that wonderful space. And it has grown over the last 20 years into a, a real special, special environment. The Arcadia City Trail is a part of the Bay Trail. Uh, so I'll refer to it both as the Arcadia City Trail and uh, Bay Trail North at times. Again, it's a class one trail, it's flat. It does have some busy road crossings, uh, especially in town a little bit. There's a crossing of Alliance and then there's a, a very uh, protected crossing of um, Samoa Boulevard that has lights and uh, bull belts to, to help you if you're a pedestrian. Um, it connects with the marsh trails. Uh, there are plans to go from skate park here. And in fact, the construction money exists and they're working on finalizing those plans to go three miles basically from the skate park out to pump station number one as a continuation of the class one multi-use trail and it will be called the Annie and Mary Trail. All right, the, this same trail continues on down through the marsh and it's the yellow line here. And it goes basically out for two miles. Here's part of the trail as it go on, goes on south to the, uh, what I call two rocks. It's the current end of this trail, which will at some point in the next, uh, I'm hoping year and a half or so be linked with the, uh, uh, Class one trail, the waterfront trail, which is also part of the, the Bay Trail in Eureka. And this connects with a variety of accessible trails in the marsh area. Not all are uh, totally ADA accessible, but many are from the uh, end of uh, I Street parking lot here. Uh, going around Clop Lake is hard packed. Um, Mount Trashmore is not. Uh, it's, it's hard packed trail, but it has some inaccessible areas. So you have to be a, a little careful to na navigate your way out. To uh, go out here to the cut, the cut that has created the salt marsh here uh, is, is, is accessible. There are others around Brackish Pond. So you sort of have to sort of pick and choose a little bit in terms of using that particular uh, set of trails. <coughs> I run into Laura McNulty every once in a while out there. She's often going around the oxidation ponds and agreed to let me take a picture of her. The oxidation ponds are not as easy to get to because there's a, a narrow stretch of, of trail uh, connecting 
the, the courtyard parking lot here with the oxidation ponds, which is a hard packed paved road. Worth getting out there if you can. And one of the things that's worth, it's I think got one of the better sunsets, all the south end of, of I Street parking lot is another great sunset viewing spot. So just within the last couple of years, uh, the Annie and Mary Trail initial half mile link, it's a class one trail in Blue Lake was completed. Again, the intent is to get at least to Glendale with that eventually um, as a class one trail. There are some other accessible trails in the Blue Lake area, including the uh, hard packed trail has, um, doesn't meet some of the the width standards, but it's fairly good, except for a little bit of a, a steeper stretch right here on the west side of the levee section. But there are several ways to sort of avoid that, including being on the levee itself. And then uh, I'll show you a picture of the hard packed road that goes along the top of the, the levee going to the east. Um, taking this road down, there's a pedestrian bridge over Powers Creek that also makes this uh, little used road usable as well to sort of extend ones uh, and create a series of other options in Blue Lake. Let's show you some pictures. So this is the, this is the class one half mile long trail that goes from downtown out towards the casino area. Um, so each way is a half mile. And then here's a picture of what the levee looks like. Um, and again, hard packed road. Okay, Reese, Reese, yeah. Reese, we go on. Um, one question is, where are the parking lots for the Blue Lake Trails? Let's, let's go back to this. So um, there is a parking area. The best one is right downtown along Railroad Avenue. And uh, adjacent there are a series of parking spots and near the entrance, the initial entrance to the, to the trail itself. Uh, our parking areas. It's street parking, uh, except at the uh, museum, which is my cursor, which is right here at the junction with Rail Railroad Avenue uh, is um, uh, off street parking. Uh, there is also some limited parking at the entrance um, to Taylor Way uh, right here. Those would be the uh, ones that I, I would highlight. There are some more, but it sort of catches catch can parking options. Um, and so those are the two that I would highlight. Thank you. So the Eureka area, uh, again, some wonderful class one options with the waterfront trail and some of its component pieces, the Hikshari trail, the wharf trail and the waterfront trail north. Then state parks, uh, the Fort Humboldt State Park, I'm going to talk about each of these in, in more detail. Sequoia Park has uh, one of the most interesting uh, options that I, I want to encourage you to consider. It's the Skywalk, and it, it's been very purposefully made accessible. Humboldt Bay Wildlife Refuge has some accessible trails there. Botanical Garden, a limited amount, but um, uh, I think interesting if, if you are a plant aficionado. And then the Headwaters Reserve has a 1.1 mile long class one um, uh, trail that goes out to the old community of Falk. So we'll talk about each of those in, in some greater detail. The waterfront trail, uh, extending from Tid Street where the Open Door Clinic is all the way out to to Hikshari Trail and the end of the Hikshari, the Elk River or Hikshari, um, is 6.5 miles long. It's all class one with some uh, uh, sidewalk mixed in there along the uh, downtown sections. Um, there are multiple points of access, so you have maximum flexibility. There are a number of toilets along the way uh, on the Hikshari end, uh, as well as on the waterfront end. Um, there are uh, other elements of interest 
such as the Wiggy Wetlands, which is behind Bayshore Mall, um, a special area that's being restored in conjunction with the Trail Stewards and the Audubon Society. There are interesting interpretive signs and eight unique sort of works of art benches sprinkled along the way. So um, the Waterfront Trail is such a wonderful way to, to have a unique view, including this 400 foot bridge that gives you a great view of, of Wiggy or Humboldt Bay. So Fort Humboldt State Historic Park is another one that tends to be a little forgotten. Um, it has a six tenths of a mile long paved trail. You can see the example of the trail here. And part of it is hard packed. It passes the reconstructed fort buildings. Uh, they have an outdoor logging display that you see in the picture here. I will say that the fort is working through state parks to do a better job of really treating that part of our rather sordid history, uh, the reason that Fort Humboldt existed, its impact on Native American populations locally. Um, it also is a great way to sort of have a in in-depth experience of, of the logging history of our area. On the third Saturdays from May through September, they have what they call the steam up and they sort of activate some of this historic logging equipment. And in April, they traditionally have uh, Dole Beer Donkey Days. So uh, something to check out on the Fort Humboldt website uh, before you make the effort to go. But anytime you can go and take advantage of, of that walk. Another sort of picture of the paved trail and the logging display. Very excited about Sequoia Park, uh, that option. Um, they've been doing a number of improvements to increase, increase the accessibility of some of the playground area, which is worth noting. Um, they also have, through the zoo, have now created, uh, many of you may have done this already, uh, but it is definitely uh, uh, an interesting experience that I cannot imagine you'd have in any other way. Um, there is a fee structure to get in and uh, that's definitely weighted uh, some advantage to being a documented resident. You need to take documentation that you are indeed a resident, which is a driver's license or something equivalent. Um, and if you uh, are eligible for uh, EBT or, or BIC kinds of things that it's a severely discounted opportunity to go. Um, oops. Before I finish this, I wanna say that uh, there are segments of this that are not um, accessible, but you can get almost out to the end of the, uh, of the walkway um, whether you uh, can walk on sort of a bouncy uh, section or not. They've really made it solid and, and impressive. Uh, and you're up as high as about 100 feet above the, the forest floor. While you're in that area, it's probably worth just taking a, a short a detour down to the Sequoia Park Garden. And uh, certain times of the year are better than others, but the Dahlia, as you see, when the Dahlia are out there, there is nothing more spectacular than the, than the Sequoia Park Garden. And that's just a little bit north of the entrance to Sequoia Park Zoo, and it's free to get in here. They have benches and, and places where you could uh, comfortably uh, eat, eat uh, and enjoy. I mentioned ah, Humboldt uh, Botanical Garden. Again, this has a fee to get in, um, but, uh, and the, the actual paved ADA accessible area is limited. It does have some hard packed road work that is sometimes sort of steep that gets you access to other parts of the garden. But the, some of the principal areas of the beds and the features of the park are on a, sh on a short accessible um, 
trail. And it's, it's worth spending a, a, a sunny afternoon enjoying that. Encourage you as just a, a point of departure to go. You can see that it's, uh, again, benefits being old like uh, us and uh, uh, has limited hours, um, 10 to four Wednesday through Sunday. But another thing that I would encourage you to, to, uh, to check their website. Humboldt Bay Wildlife Refuge has two trails that are worth highlighting. One is the Shorebird Loop. Um, it's 1.75 miles long. It's flat. It's a hard packed surface. It's a great place to view the recovery of the Aleutian cackling geese. Um, it is also, and I'm going to talk about the fly off in a moment. Um, and then Hooked and Slough is on the slough top on the levee top. It's uh, also about a mile and a half long uh, one way and uh, it's hard packed surface and gives you unique access to Hooked and Slough and this area of, of the bay. Um, again, I should mention that it can be windy and no dogs on either one of these. My wife and I have been out every time we've been out to uh, to the Hooked and Slough port portion, we've seen an otter. And I, it's not a guarantee, but there certainly is a significant otter presence uh, here. And uh, it's usually on the non-bay side of the, of the levee. And the Aleutian cackling geese. So coming up actually on Saturdays and Sundays in March, the uh, entrance gate is open one half hour before sunrise, rain or shine. Most of these days it seems to be shine to allow visitors to watch the fly off of all of these thousands, tens of thousands of, of geese. Um, the visitor center, the bathrooms are closed. They have a porta potty and the walk begins at the visitor center and follows that as much as the 1.75 mile loop. And I have a phone number there for more information, definitely worth considering as a possibility and considering doing. A little sense of what it looks like. It's hard to fully grasp it until you also hear the noise and just feel the whole, the atmosphere, everything. Uh, from the end of Elk River, there's a, a great parking area and the Bureau of Land Management has done a wonderful job of building this 1.1 mile long ADA accessible class one multi-purpose trail out to the old site of Falk. There's not much remaining, but they have put uh, uh, up some signs, informational signs along the way. And there is a, a staffed only part-time but a, a, a visitor center of sorts that's halfway along that trail. And it's one that's definitely, I think, worth a, a visit. Um, see the, this is my map of, of that, the educational center. There, there are some benches and, and picnic tables along the way. And then the turnaround point, um, oh, that's the parking lot, I'm sorry. This is the old town site and then the educational center. Um, and it's all paved. So dogs are okay with BLM too. Okay, now we're going farther south. Uh, Fortuna, Rio Dell, Humboldt Redwood State Park, Riverwalk and Fortuna is a great uh, hard packed surface walkway along the uh, Eel River or the Weot. Uh, Fortuna Open Door Clinic has a, has a very small, but recently opened, their new clinic area has a recently opened uh, accessible walkway between that and the adjacent hospital. Um, Rio Del, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then um, four options down in Humboldt Redwood State Park. Riverwalk South, many of you probably already know that. And this is a picture of that hard packed paved walkway slash trail slash road. 
It's not open to traffic, so you don't have to worry about competing. This is the River Lodge here, probably the best place to park. And then you can actually go either north or south along the levee. Uh, south goes for about two miles down to Fowler Road. Um, north is a much shorter distance, but it does hook in through this industrial area. Unfortunately, this way back is along the road and along sort of sidewalk mixed. I, I, I wouldn't recommend that part. So I, I think if you're gonna go north, it'd be to go just out and back. There is a picnic area right here, but um, it's, it's a very pleasant place to go and, uh, and experience the, the Eel River. Here's my map of the Open Door Community Health Center in Fortuna. Um, the, the walkway goes around, again, it's, uh, it's accessible, it goes around like this. From here is an extended that goes over to the uh, adjacent Redwood Memorial, I guess Providence Redwood Memorial Hospital. Um, and then you can come back and it passes a little food garden in this area, and then a, a little mini wetlands in this area. So it's, it's pleasant, it's not big, it's, it's a, wouldn't be a, a bad place to go for a short evening uh, outing. I was hesitant to include this, but uh, I really commend Rio Dell because I think they're really trying to make a difference. They have uh, tried to get, I'm gonna show you a picture of the spirit of full disclosure. This, it's not much more than a glorified uh, Sidewalk with style, it goes along route, it's Wildwood uh, Avenue, and it sort of goes down past the, uh, some of the uh, park and amenities area to the city hall area in Rio Dell. But of note is that they just recently announced they got a couple million dollar grant to sort of create a, a trail using three major roads, including Wildwood uh, in, in Rio Dell. So I think, Going forward with the next couple of years, it will be constructed. I think it's an exciting new possibility for folks in the Southern part of the, the county in the Rio Dell area. All right, this is the Drury Cheney walkway. Uh, you can see that it is hard packed surface uh, through the redwoods. It's very flat. Um, there are some areas where it's, I think, not always perfectly maintained to state park standards, but um, it is a nice walkway um, throughout the length and it does a, a modified loop. Here I have a map from the park parking area off the Avenue of the Giants going out this way past the old Barkdall Road um, and then sort of a partial loop with some bridges across some, some seasonal water courses here. Uh, good, good bridges and back. And full length is 2.4 miles, but you can cut it short. I want to highlight here because there are some areas of poison oak right here around the entrance. So you just have to be, be careful. The Founders Grove, another short trail, but uh, one of my favorites again shown here. Uh, what makes it, I think, a special place is the Dyerville Giant, which fell down now more than 30 years ago, which is relatively amazing. At the time, it was one of the top 10 tallest redwoods, but seeing it on the ground uh, up close is just sort of amazing. And here are a couple of shots of it on this slide, um, how massive it is, and then the trail that goes around and, and by it. There are restrooms available. Again, it's, it's short. Um, but it's pretty spectacular. High return for uh, low distance. And that's pretty much the same with the Rockefeller Grove, um, which is off of the Matoll Road, a short distance off of the Matoll Road. And it again has sort of a loop that goes through a lot like the uh, Founders Grove loop. Um, it's short, but with high return because of the spectacular trees. Here's a, um, a little map here that gives you a sense, I included more, but the actual, this is the parking area and then the loop, little loop trail that goes around that. 
Okay. Two others that I mentioned that are worth highlighting are down near the Burlington Visitor Center off the Avenue of the Giants near Weot. Um, one is the Gould Grove. This is a nature trail with the signage to accordingly, and it's a seven tenths of a mile loop, hard packed surface. Um, and then the Fleischmann Trail, which is 1.4 miles uh, one way, again, hard packed surface. Both are uh, right next to the uh, Avenue of the Giants, but there's sort of nice options pinned in between the, the Avenue and uh, the South Fork of the Eel River. All right, there are a couple of unexpected things that I thought I would just highlight. Um, one is the Bigfoot Golf Club in Willow Creek. I'll talk about that in, in a moment. And the other one uh, is, for those of you that might go down to the southern part near uh, this area near Shelter Cove, Wailaki Campground uh, in this area has a very short uh, two point, 0.25 tenths of a mile. It's the Bureau of Land Management's effort to try to create interesting and different accessible trails. Uh, but it is a 0.25 uh, accessible trail, sort of nature trail signed accordingly in, in that area. Probably not one that most of you will make the, the long trip down there to take advantage of. But if you are in the area, it's worth the possibility of doing that. But if you go to Willow Creek, this is one that's a little more worth a stop. The Bigfoot Golf Course closed in 2018. Um, it's, it's owned by a, a cannabis company in, in Arcata that at this point is allowing the public to, uh, to walk or drive the perimeter trail. And uh, I think as long as it continues to be fairly dry, you can go on some of the, the, the course itself. Leash dogs are allowed. We, I talked with a guy who they actually paid to do a little maintenance work on the area. He said, just clean up after them, but make sure they're leashed. Um, I think treating this area with respect, it's actually quite a nice uh, spot um, to go on over there. Um, I think as long as it's treated with respect, maybe the owners will continue to allow this to occur. It's been the last four years that that has happened and I'm hoping going forward until they have another use for it. Uh, I really hope that that will be, be the, the case still going forward. This is the Bear Creek Nature Trail that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's, it's sort of sweet if you happen to be in that area. Okay, one of the last extras that I want, want to talk about is our beach wheelchairs. The Coastal Commission has made available these kind of wide tired inflatable wheelchairs uh, at a variety of locations in Humboldt County. The Humboldt Coastal Nature Center as Friends of the Dunes facility is one. The um, Sume Visitor Center. Uh, the chair can be checked out there, uh, but it, it's, there's no accessible beach there, so you'd have to take it elsewhere. Uh, Stone Lagoon um, is another one. Freshwater Lagoon, the visitor center at Kukul Visitor Center uh, for Redwood National Park is another one. Um, so this is an opportunity to take advantage of these that are made available through the Coastal Commission to citizens that have an interest in these specialized the county parks, on the other hand, has a different approach. And they are in the just in the process, this is something that they're working on right now of creating this matway that would be a, a permanent emplacement and it would be put in place um, to Clam Beach from the northernmost uh, parking area where it would allow um, the wheelchair to get out through the soft sand. I guess they've had problems with the uh, some of the wheelchairs in the wheelchair, here's their wheelchair that would be available to get out and enjoy the, the hard pack surface on Clam Beach. And uh, it's, I just was talking with one of the staff yesterday for, or, or on Saturday for, uh, for this project. 
and it's not ready quite yet. So again, it may be worth ca calling county parks, but it's soon to be ready. And I think will be a, a very exciting way to have some access to, to Clam Beach. All right, that's the end. I, I do have time for questions. I wanna make one other pitch. Uh, I would love to have more pictures of people that are taking advantage of the ADA accessible trails locally. And if they could be, if people would feel comfortable sending them to me for use. And I'd like to have more uh, non-traditional pictures, uh, not just sort of the standard scenery pictures and some of my uh, informational guides going forward or slideshows that I do um, that really reflect the diversity of, of, of users in Humboldt County for many reasons, not the least of which is that I think it helps people that are supporting and funding ADA uh, accessible trails and uh, class one trails, which are more expensive. I think when they see users, um, it really makes a difference. So uh, send me pictures of uh, appropriate uh, use out, out there and I will use them myself and going forward. Um, if there are questions, this is a great time for me to take them, I'll take a drink. And otherwise I really appreciate you participating in this today. Reese, there are questions and, and thank you. Um, real quick before we move on from the beach wheelchairs, there's a question about if you have any idea what if there's any kind of weight limit on those beach wheelchairs. Do you have any idea? You know, I, I do not know that. Yeah, um, I, I, I thought I might be able to call, but I, I, I wasn't able to do that. So, yeah. yeah. I, um, I think um, one of the challenges has been is that they have not had that many users. And mm -hmm. um, so I think there, there'll be a lot to be learned. I know that um, Part of the reason that County Parks is is putting in that that uh, access to Clam Beach is that they have made it available to some folks who have used their county wheelchair only to get stuck out in the soft sand, even with the the wider wheels. So um, I think they're sort of figuring it out a little bit as they go. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going back to um, a comment and question that was posed quite a bit earlier. It's about um, the, co the Coalition of Responsible Transportation Priorities out of Berkeley mm -hmm. offers public a way to report accidents near Mrs. Unsafe Conditions. Um, and uh, Ali is wondering if we have anything, anything equivalent to that uh, data collecting um, site for accessible trail users to report conditions. Um, I, I don't have a, a good answer. There are a couple of resources that come to mind. Um, Colin Fisk and his group, uh, the Coalition for Transportation Alternatives, and I, have, I don't have that right, would be a great place. They've been vigilant advocates uh, for pedestrian uh, safety. Um, and then I think the most effective is to call the the uh, responsible organization for a particular trail if there is a safety issue or concern. I think calling directly and that kind of direct feedback is, is uh, there's nothing that beats that. Thank you. I'm just going to go ahead and, and read through these comments as they've come in and, and some questions. Um, Alyssa Norman is asking if there's a way that she can reach out to you. She's from Tri-County Independent Living. So if you want to share your uh, contact, yeah, I'm happy to uh, put I, my email is my last name, Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S, at Humboldt.edu. And uh, that's probably the, the best way. Great. And then um, Ivy is wondering if you or anyone that you know of has created a pamphlet or online map that folks can go to to look up these accessible trails. I'm not aware of one uh, at this point. Uh, I will say that the landscape is changing so so quickly um, that it's uh, it's a brave brave entity that puts out something in writing these days. Um, so it'd be nice to have uh, have a resource that's online uh, and it may be a place where it, 
changes in trail conditions could be reported in, in more in real time. Yeah. But um, well, maybe this brown bag presentation will be the online the research. trigger for that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Reese, for a great overview. And um, uh, thank ADA you, trails are also wonderful for parents and grandparents pushing strollers. I should mention that my current project, I'm working with Humboldt First Five on a, a trail guide that will be focused on families with young children. And uh, we'll be highlighting 30 local trails that are really family friendly. And that's, okay. that's uh, going forward. I'm not sure that's an Ollie presentation, but uh, uh, certainly the wrong age group. But uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, we I didn't know a lot, a lot of us have grandchildren. True, that's true. We yeah. end up, you know, taking them all over the place. So oh, was, there, was there a book, Jane, Jane or uh, uh, Reese, is there a book you show at the beginning? That... Yeah, the, the best resource is pretty self-serving. It's probably the one okay. I've done, and that's Hiking Humboldt. But Hiking within Humboldt. that, okay, thank you. Uh, volume, volume two, the Hiking Humboldt volume one is uh, long hikes. Those are not ADA accessible. Um, okay. But, you know, it's not a perfect resource because the target audience are right. not uh, people limited to ADA okay. trails. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. I learned so much and I'm going to do all of them. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> and and I want to thank you also, Reese, as ever, you've done a fabulous presentation mm -hmm. and we very much appreciate it. And I want to invite you all back to March 14th, next Monday for the UN Glasgow update, the negotiations to action presented by Andy Tuttle who's a consultant for forests and climate policy. The UN climate negotiations in Glasgow finally completed the text for the Paris rule books, real book. Now countries focus on delivering their pledges to reduce emissions. We'll take a high level overview of where we stand and how far is still to go. So we hope to see you again next week. And thanks so much to everybody for coming and Reese for Thank your you. wonderful presentation. Uh, Mr. Hughes, Hughes, I have a question yeah. if I may. Um, do you, where would I go for a similar information for Del Norte and or Trinity counties, please? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any, any resources. There's not even a good trail guide of any sort uh, for either of those areas. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that, that that's uh, area that is open for future possibilities. I, I must admit, I thought about doing a trail guide for uh, Del Norte County uh, going forward. And um, if I do that, I certainly include ADA accessible trails. Thank you. And and I'm with Tri-County Independent Living in the Del Norte office. So oh, well, you to hook up with you. Thank you. OK. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Reese and everybody for coming. Take care now. And go out and enjoy this wonderful day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Go go walk a trip. Okay, I'm going. I'm going.